All right, good evening, everyone. This is day three, the final night of the uh, first ever virtual conference, theological conference coming to you from near Atlanta, Georgia. So the final night is uh, Anthony Buzzard coming on in a in a few minutes. First, let's get a couple of things out of the way. So if you're on the chat and uh, if you don't have an image or a sound, just refresh the page and uh, you should get it. Also, this is the last night to to uh, join the raffle, it'll be drawn tomorrow morning. So if you have not um, given me your name, I will put my email and you can email me. And uh, this is for one of four Shema's handmade by Anthony himself. So the closest thing. <laughs> All right, and they're free by the way, free, no, no charge. <laughs> Uh, tomorrow, we will have uh, Pastor Dennis Baldwin sermonizing us, and then he will be officiating an online Sunday communion. So I have been uh, telling you since day one, so you can get your emblems, your wine, and your bread ready. So tomorrow, after the sermon, Sunday communion service, if you want to participate, all the sessions are automatically uh, uploaded or should be uploaded automatically on our youtube.com restoration fellowship <clears throat> uh, channel. Let's see what else. If you have any questions for Anthony, you can send them to me on the chat while he's speaking or towards the end. And uh, we'll have uh, some time at the end for a Q&A session received written. All right, well, Anthony really doesn't need an introduction, but I'll give him any, one anyway, and I'll give you the Wikipedia article. Uh, there you go. So Sir Anthony Buzzard is the third baronet. You can find out what that means. <clears throat> and um, yes, he's considered a spiritual father to many around the world. And we're glad to have him. As you can see, he was born a long, long time ago, <laughs> almost in a galaxy far away. But it was a different world, 1935. That's for sure. Uh, Anthony will be working off uh, a paper. So I'm glad to say that the paper is online. So you go to theologicalconference.org, click presenters, all the way at the bottom of this page. You should see that folder on the left, click it once, and there we go. Okay, so that's good. We have Tracy's paper as well. Uh, Ken, Kenneth Laprade also wrote a sort of a mini bio. Ken is a former The Way International person, and this is the paper he presented, but he also has written The Wayfarer's Journey, a sort of mini bio of his uh, former days in this uh, cult called the Way International from the 60s to 80s and 90s. It survives in a limited form, thank goodness, today. But it was a horrible experience looking back. And uh, you can find out if you contact Ken Laprade or you can contact me and I'll give you his contact. Okay, so back to Anthony, just click on Anthony. And there it is. He will be speaking about accepting Jesus. So Anthony, can you unmute yourself, please? That sort of skill I, I do have, limited, okay. Go ahead. Okay. All right, thank you so much, Carlos. And thanks to you for very smooth and uh, calming organization. You got everybody into their speeches and out of their speeches, questions and answers. And of course you have this amazing technological information, which I don't have, full of admiration for that. So thank you for that. And also thanks to Sarah, who's been working on the second edition of our translation, which will be going to the printer and being printed within the next couple of months. That's exciting for us. 
So I want to make a very simple point to you. Nothing complicated, nothing hair splitting, Greek words, none of that. However, simplicity is the essence of it. And I want to say something rather to me interesting. I know a thing or two because I've seen a thing or two. Been working at this now since about 1955 when I heard Armstrong say the kingdom of God is coming and Herbert Armstrong was leader of a Sabbath keeping cult, which I immediately joined to the despair of my parents who put up with me as they did with their three children very bravely. But I've done the cult thing. I have done the cult thing. I know what it's like to have a guru dictating often in a very amateur way, may I say, what the theology is. So I did that. And coming out of that, I had then we had to decide. We came out of it about 1974. And we had then to say, now what are we going to do? Well, the Christadelphians were there with their gospel of the kingdom. And that made good sense to me. Always has, as you heard, Maggio, a genuine kingdom believer today, speaking so enthusiastically of the kingdom of God. We came out and the Christadelphians said, Ranton, you're wrong on the pre-existence of Jesus. I said, show me, we've been wrong. About three months later, I could see you can't pre-exist yourself. So Jesus was really human. So you can imagine the excitement of my hearing Dale and uh, Bill Schlegel, particularly on the Jesus is man, but not a man. I mean, all of that is what we've worked with for 30 years now, 40 years. Very exciting to hear the others coming to it. And uh, then we said, well, now what do we do? We had this belief that the dead are dead. The dead are actually sleeping in the ground until the resurrection. That belief was enough to get us kicked out of every Bible study there was in England. There weren't so many denominations, but the Baptists didn't like us. The Charismatics didn't like us. Nobody liked us. The moment we said we thought the dead were dead. Well, that poses an interesting question. What is this? Are we the only people on the earth who understand that one God, as we had it then, kingdom of God, sleep of the dead. So then, Barbara being from Michigan, it was easy for us to come back to America. I got in very easy. I got a green card in about five minutes, no problem. And we arrived in America in 1981 and stayed in California, La Jolla. And we said to people, Christadelphians mostly, because we'd mixed and mingled with them. They, by the way, told me there's no devil. You are the devil, Anthony. I said, teach me. Okay, we've been wrong on everything. Two years later, after extended discussion on that question, I was absolutely, to, and to this day, unable to get my mind around the idea that there's no external devil. That, that's another subject. But here we were with that set of beliefs. So then we said, well, is there anybody out there like the Christadelphians? And well, they said, well, there is this Abraham group. They didn't know the name exactly. I said, give me that phone number. Phoned on a Friday night, and Russ McGaw was the editor of the magazine, I think, that time, the Restitution Herald. And I said, I'm Anthony from England. We're looking for fellowship. Do you believe in the devil? Externally, yes. Because the Christadelphians would not have us in fellowship as long as we believed there was a devil. I don't want to, to discourage you, but I want to tell you that it is mass chaos and confusion. If I can get any point over to you this evening, it, it, is, it is that error is far more aggressive than you imagine. It's very aggressive. And unless we are activists ourselves, we're not going to get anywhere. We've got to be activists. So that's my major point. So I'm starting my paper here. It's called Alert and Alarm. I want us to say there's tons of work to be done for all of us. And my question is, will you accept Jesus? I had gone to a meeting at Oxford way back in the 50s or 60s, I think before the Armstrong encounter, probably. And they said, come forward and accept Jesus. And I went back to my room at Oxford at that time. And I said, what does that mean? And that's the question I'm putting to you today. Will you accept Jesus? Or Jesus has been censored. Oh, yes. And from your local Baptist church. So I want you to say, what am I getting from the pastor who believes that Jesus is three, who believes in going to heaven when you die? Is this fair? Am I supposed to converge with such people or what is the deal? I'm going to leave you to make up your mind on that, but I'm going to start then with this. And you thought of this yesterday. Mary was right. At the wedding there, whatever he tells you to do, do it. That is the New Testament. 
all the struggle about faith and works and all of that stuff that gets so convoluted sometimes from one end of the bible to the other it's are you going to do what god says or not or god speaking in jesus it's all a matter of obedience and so those texts at the front there first one is john 2 5 mary was right whatever he tells you to do do it that's your slogan those other texts hebrews 5 9 i used to say to the students I taught at the Bible college for 25 years. I used to say, joking, I want you to preach this verse 10 times every Sunday. And I wasn't kidding because people don't know these verses. And you're only going to know them when you start using them in your own apologetics. Try talking a Christadelphian into belief in the real devil. It's a fascinating experience. I've had a very pleasant Christadelphian engage me in that conversation for months, not in an angry way, very gentle. But unless you get into activism and apologetics in some form, you're not going to know the Bible as well as you will after you've done that. John 3, 36, he who believes in the Son is doing well. But he who disobeys the Son, note the contrast, is doing badly. It's all a matter of obedience. I'm the son of an admiral, so we did know as children, and dad was very gentle, but we knew what it was what it was to be told what to do. The Bible is, are you going to obey Jesus or not? But the Billy Graham system, if I may put it that way, and not trying to be hard on any way, doesn't work out of that kind of gospel. So I'm trying to show you this evening that there's a very great gap, to use Joe's good phrase, using another connection with spark plugs. There's a yawning cavern of a gap between what Billy Graham calls the gospel and what Jesus and Paul called the gospel. I would add this, that in 1981, then having come to America, we proceeded to Oregon and a very seasoned preacher of the Abrahamic faith people, Clyde Randall, met me in the archives in Oregon. And he said to me, Anthony, I want to leave you with something most important. And I was listening. He said, don't ever try to converge or mix or shake hands with the Bill Graham system. He said, I tried that. He tried it. Doesn't work. Don't do it. We have to be very careful about compromise because that's what got Israel into trouble all the time. They want to be like everybody else. We don't want to be so isolationist as to talk to nobody. I'm not suggesting that at all. We should talk to everybody all the time. But I think we have to be very careful not to coalesce, converge, and compromise. I'm not suggesting you do what in Nehemiah, one of the leaders there said to people who are compromising, he said, I'll show you what. He said, I'll pull your hair out and punch you in the nose or something extraordinary in Nehemiah. No, no, we're not talking about that sort of resistance, but be careful. Just believing that God is one is not the totality of the gospel. You've got to do what Jesus says, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God. Yes, Defining God, marvelous, brilliant. And there's a new book out, by the way, Defining the Gospel extremely well. So it could be in the next few years that there will be many people coming on board with us. I'm hoping that will be so. Okay, this is an easy slogan then. Do whatever Jesus tells you. The voice from heaven in the ministry of Jesus said, this is my son, for goodness sake, do what he says. So, of course, we put this band around our wrist saying, what would Jesus do? That's not wrong. How about what would Jesus tell you to do? What would Jesus say? Because the devil, I want to suggest to you, has one major trick. That's to separate Jesus from his teachings. That's what I'm against. Don't want ever to do that. You cannot have Jesus without his gospel. That would be another Jesus. And, of course, Bill Schlegel's talk was enormously encouraging to me, among all of them. Thank you so much for all of you speakers. You were vastly encouraging for, for our Christian walk. First, I want to start with three verses there at the top. I'll call them timetable verses. I don't think that even people in the Abrahamic faith understand this well. The law and the prophets were until what? Until John. Since the time of John, Christianity has been preached. I'm not hearing enough of the gospel of the kingdom phrase. Whenever you say gospel for the rest of your life, always say gospel of the kingdom. We may get a change. That's a marvelous statement, because I'm going to show you with some very striking quotes as we go through that that's not what the system out there believes. 
Hebrews 2, 3, I noticed this in the Greek only the other day. Salvation, it says, has its beginning. The Greek word achi, beginning. Not just it began, but it has its beginning in the words of Jesus. Please meditate on these marvelous texts. Then the law was given by Moses. But by contrast, grace and truth came through Jesus Messiah, Acts 10. This is the message of the gospel for the people of Israel, the preaching of the gospel of peace through Jesus. He was unappreciated, who is Lord of all. You know that this happened, Peter said, throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee. Not beginning at Pentecost, beginning in Galilee after baptism, which John preached. Isn't that marvelous? Please make sure your children understand the timetable. The present new covenant dispensation, I use that word deliberately because I'm going to talk a bit about dispensationalism, but there is an economy that started with John the Baptist. Guess what? It started with the gospel of the kingdom. But out there, you're being told aggressively and deliberately that the kingdom of God gospel is not, I repeat, not for you. Now, be careful. I've been meditating, and we're learning all the time, by the way, all the time. How could it be that Jesus could say to some people, get out of here, I never knew you? That's the most threatening text. I don't read it often. I don't like it in Matthew 7. How could that possibly be? I got to thinking about this, Lord, Lord, why do you call me Lord, Lord? That's in Luke. You know the text well. Why do you call me Lord, Lord? Would you refuse to do what I say? Not refuse to do what I do even, although that would be included. You refuse to do what I say. My teachings, my teachings, my teachings, my teachings. So I'm going to give you a couple of verses very shortly, which are, should be absolutely refrigerator verses uh, for you and your children. I start there with Dr. Martin Werner in his famous formation of Christian dogma. He wrote this very discerningly. Quote, According to the New Testament witnesses, in the teaching of Jesus, and I'm talking about the teaching of Jesus, that's the whole point of our talk, and the apostles relative to the monotheism of the Old Testament and Judaism, there had been no change whatsoever. So if you don't believe in the unitary monotheism of Jesus, you've abandoned Jesus. I don't recommend that. It's all about the teaching of Jesus and Paul, of course, as well, but it's all about the teaching of Jesus. That marvelous Shema for which Jews died is a unitary monotheistic, a non-Trinitarian statement. Any Jew knows that. Write to the chief rabbi and ask him. Jews died for that extraordinary um, unitary monotheistic test. Listen, listen, O Israel. Here, don't miss this. Listen now. The Lord our God is one Lord, I would translate. It doesn't matter. The Lord alone, the Lord is one, doesn't matter. The Lord our God is one Lord. Every Jew knows that. Every Muslim understands it. If you don't begin with the teaching of Jesus, you're in bad trouble. If you start by discarding the creed of Jesus, you're in very great trouble. So I'm against that. And then he says, rightly, this is a confirmation by Jesus himself without any reservation of the supreme monotheistic confession of faith of Israelite religion in its complete form. That's a brilliant statement, uh, Martin Werner. Thank you for that. It's wonderful. Now, I've got various statements from various scholars that I've collected over the years, and you will see the point being made. In his revisioning evangelical theology, Stanley Grentz has looked at all the failed attempts of evangelicalism to fire the imagination of the modern world, that's to say on a grand scale, he argues, for guess what? The kingdom of God as the new organizing center of what we say and do. Hallelujah, he's got it. Why don't you write to him, engage him, say, we've been doing this. Would you like to read our books or whatever? Marvelous statement. What about this? It may be said that the teaching of Jesus concerning the kingdom of God, the Vasilia to Theu, kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God, exactly the same thing, represents his whole teaching. It's the main determinative subject of all Jesus' discourse. Jesus' ethics were ethics of the kingdom. His theology was theology of the kingdom. His teaching regarding himself cannot be understood 
apart from his interpretation of the kingdom of God, F.C. Grant. I've been collecting these quotes. I've been very blessed to do this as a job. It means nothing. It grants no kind of infallibility. But I've had time with the use of uh, my own library, which is now about 5,000 books, many of them donated, given, secondhand, whatever. But these are wonderful statements. Now, Winston Churchill. If you have an important point to make, don't try to be too subtle or clever. Use a pile driver, hit the point once, come back and hit it again. Then hit it a third time, a tremendous whack. That is so true, all of you who teach. Don't assume that your audience understands what you do. You're there to teach them. So you make a simple point. My point to you is you must pay attention to the teachings of Jesus about the one God and the gospel of the kingdom. So there's the text that I say is, is a horrifying, alarming verse from Jesus, right? Not everyone who says to me, Kyrie, Kyrie, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God, same thing. Only the one who does the pleasure, I like that word, of my Father in heaven. I've used various translations, 89, 99% or probably 98% of all translations are right, by the way, don't, don't be exercised over that. I really appreciate what Sean did there. He mentioned some other translations. I like the NAB. The Roman Catholic Bible is often very, very good. We use the New American Standard. The uh, NIV is rather Trinitarian. However, use various translations. Better still have the BibleWorks software or the Logos software where you can click on and look at 60 translations at a glance. So not everyone who says to me, Kyrie will enter the kingdom only those who do the will of the Father in heaven. I want to stop and introduce or intersperse another verse there. We came across this only the other day. Jeremiah 23, verse 5. Carlos has a way of flicking things on the screen beautifully. Jeremiah 23. You'll find it. You'll see how quick he is. Jeremiah 23, verse 5. I think I've got it right. I didn't get it right. What happened, Sarah? 27.5. 27, I will say that in my ancient age at 85, I don't remember verses as I said. Sorry, I made a mistake. Jeremiah 27, verse 5. Listen to this one. By my great strength and outstretched arm, I, Jehovah, Yahweh, doesn't matter how you pronounce it, I made the earth and the people and the animals on the face of the earth, and I give it to anyone I please. How could you not be excited about that? God wants to give you the world. And now I'm going to use a phrase that I learned from Robin Todd in his excellent talk. He said, you are going to be part of the solution. Everybody in America, whatever television station you watch, you know, I'm watching Fox, and, you know, now and again, because there are certain ideas that, that appeal. We're not into politics at all. But you are training to be the solution to the mess we're in. Wow, if that doesn't get you excited, what would? God wants to give you the whole creation, but he's going to look at you carefully before he entrusts you with that. That's why through much tribulation we enter, not through the great tribulation, there's a way to escape that on the earth without going to heaven, but through much testing and trial. We enter, we're destined to enter the kingdom of God. That is wonderful. Okay, now I want to get to the crunch verses, which are refrigerator verses par excellence. Observe how the apostles, Paul and John, these apostles, these holy apostles, they knew what was coming. They warned us, as Jesus had warned us, of the ultimate and fatal error. Here's what you don't want to do. If anyone comes and teaches otherwise and does not agree to the health-giving teaching of Jesus Christ, this is 1 Timothy 6.3, if that should happen, I'm reading it now from my paper, you have it on the screen and the paper, if anybody comes and teaches otherwise and doesn't agree to the health-giving teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ and godly teaching, they're conceited and understand nothing. And he goes on, they have an unhealthy interest in controversies, controversies, controversy, whatever, and quarrels about words that result in strife and malicious talk, etc., etc., etc. You don't want to avoid the teaching of Jesus. You start with the gospel of the kingdom. 
and you follow with the Shema and then all of the Sermon on the Mount and the teaching of Jesus and Paul, who speaks for Jesus. And John then said the same thing. Listen to John, 2 John 7 to 9. I say this because many deceivers who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming as fully human, and Bill Schlegel's point was very, very important. Out there, your friends believe that Jesus is man, but not a man. You want to throw these texts out to people to get them to spit out the nonsense that they've been taught. They don't even know that that's what they've been taught, but they should know. So if anybody comes denying that Jesus is fully human, you can only be human by starting in the womb of your mother. That's what a human being does. If you meet such a person, watch out in 2 John 7 to 9 that you do not lose what we have worked for, but that you may be rewarded fully. You can get a full reward, a less full reward. Go for the high prizes. Anyone who runs ahead, that's to say, in the name of progress, and doesn't continue in the didachi, the teaching, didachi, I should say, the teaching of Messiah does not have God. But whoever continues in that teaching has both the Father and the Son. Isn't that clear? Now I'm going to show you that out there, leading evangelicals, especially known as dispensationalists with a capital D, are saying the precise opposite of what Paul and John say. And I want to start near to home because we have people who have had a background in the way international. And in a certain book called One Lord, One God, you, some of you will know what that is. I want to read you a quote. Beware. Listen to this. Perhaps one of the most confusing of these additions has been the page between Malachi and Matthew, which says the New Testament. He says that's confusing. Our experience, this is the X-Way International people writing, our experience among Christians has been that almost all of them believe that Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John are part of the New Testament. This error has many significant ramifications. I would not do a favor if I didn't point out that that is fundamentally false. If you think the Gospels belong in the Old Testament, you are very much mistaken. And they do actually mitigate their own statements, say the opposite. I won't read that, but you can look it up. Now, what about this then? The same capital D dispensationalist systemic error. You hear a lot about systemic in the pandemic language these days. Systemic error. Moody Bible Church, I wrote to them. I want to find out what do these people teach. In 1996, here's what he wrote. I believe that the gospel of the kingdom is different from the gospel of the grace of God. The gospel of the kingdom has to do with the preparation of the people of Israel for the coming millennial kingdom. If they had repented, Christ would have established and could have established that kingdom. Of course, we know they didn't. And he had to die and be raised. Then he says the gospel, this is the Moody Bible Church. The gospel of the grace of God has, quote, nothing to do with the kingdom, but is a message of repentance. Listen, it couldn't get worse than that. You might as well proclaim atheism as loud as you can as to be so deceived as not to understand that the gospel of the kingdom is the Christian gospel. Then Charles Ryrie, I'm just piling on the agony here, the gain, the systematic error and obstruction of Jesus. This is antichrist to the pure uh, extent from my point of view. Charles Ryrie, I think the gospel of the kingdom has to do with the messianic kingdom. And that gospel about the kingdom was preached by John the Baptist and by Jesus during his earthly ministry and will be preached again in the future. Do you see that? Your friends in these evangelical churches do not understand the gospel of the kingdom. You see, Ryrie is saying, oh, yes, Jesus preached the kingdom. But we don't preach that gospel of the kingdom now. That's just for Jews at the very end of the age. It couldn't get worse than that. Now, I'll quote F.F. F. Bruce, makes a simple and correct statement. F.F. F. Bruce was the bright boy of the Plymouth Brethren. Very good to me. He wrote me handwritten letters 25, 30 years ago to encourage me. And this is absolutely brilliant. The kingdom which Jesus spoke of during his ministry was the kingdom foretold in the book of Daniel, of course, which the God of heaven was to set up in the latter days 
and which would supersede all previous empires and would endure forever. That's a hundred percent, a thousand percent right. And now here's the text that started the whole movement in the Abrahamic faith, Acts 8, 12. Every movement needs a slogan. John 3, 16 is well known. It's a marvelous day, but by itself is a little bit too vague for people. But they chose Acts 8, 12 as their slogan in the 1850s when the Abrahamic people were getting started. Here's what is said by F.F. F. Bruce correctly. Acts 8, 12, this was not a different gospel from that which our Lord and his apostles proclaimed before the cross. Its keynotes were still, as Jesus said, repentance, remission of sin, accompanied by water baptism, absolutely essential, non-negotiable -nego water baptism, gift of the spirit, evidential works, all of that. Now it acquired a deeper significance after the death of Christ. That's quite true. It was the same gospel, says F.F. F. Bruce, as our Lord Jesus foretold would be preached among all the nations and which before his ascension, he charged his disciples to make known. It is identical, says Bruce, correctly, with the gospel of the grace of God. So on the screen there, you see Acts 20, verse 24 and 25. Those verses are hiding. Some of you don't realize the extent to which preaching is an exercise in confusion and muddle and the hiding of key verses. So Acts 20, verse 24, Paul said, summarizing his own ministry, I want to finish my course. The ministry I see from the Lord to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. I have heard evangelicals stop there and fail to read the next verse where he defines what the, that is. I now know that none of you will ever see my face again. Everyone I went about preaching the kingdom to. That should be clear. Please teach your children that verse because the system out there doesn't want you to understand that. I'm grateful for the work that David Krogh did week after week after week in Oregon when the Bible College was there. When we had staff meetings, he went on about the Great Commission a great deal. And I have not forgotten that. So the kingdom of God gospel is the same as the grace of God. Whenever you come to the word grace in Paul, by all means substitute the gospel of the grace of God. It's very gracious of God to offer you the world and to use Robin Todd's very good phrase that I learned this week. You are being invited through much tribulation now to be part of the solution. God wants you. Oh, I know that I need Jesus. I'm not denying that for a minute. But what if Jesus and God need you? So I used to say to the students, what talent have you got that God didn't give you? The answer is none. Your job is to use your talent behind and, and supporting the gospel of the kingdom of God and the things concerning Jesus, Acts 8, 12. We have at our site free a book by Wiley Jones from Virginia in the 1880s, I think. If you want your children or yourself to get a real shot of kingdom of God gospel stuff, by all means, read free at our site, Focus on the Kingdom. Wiley Jones, 10 Discourses on the Kingdom of God. It will make you as excited about the kingdom. Oh, thank you. There it is. Wonderful. Right there. It takes just a few hours and you will become like Major, who is so excited as you heard in his faith story about the kingdom. <laughs> so then, look at this. Don Sumdal, in the second paragraph of that page three, a graduate now at Dallas Theological Seminary. <coughs> he says this, most Christian churches spend the majority of their time in the gospel. I don't think that's true. You've got Matthew, Mark, and Luke, three corroborating accounts of the teaching of Jesus. That might be significant. Three times over. And then he says, while Christians should study all of the scriptures, this is what Don Samdal says. The Gospels contain no Christianity. What? That is pure, unadulterated antichrist. Do you see that? He says this may be shocking, but it's true. It's shocking, and it's totally untrue. Not one word of Christianity exists in the Gospels. The Gospels are all Jewish. That's just for Jews. What? 
they contain only Judaism and Jewish theology. And that's found at a site called Are the Gospel Christian. Now, some of you would like to take upon yourself to talk to Don Samdal very gently and say, wait a minute, what you're saying there is not what I read in the book of Acts because Paul, as we have it now in our next quote, and Don Samdal said also, Paul did not preach the gospel of the kingdom. What has he read Acts 28, 23, 31? A quote from the Bible now. They arranged to meet Paul a certain day came in even larger numbers to the place where he was staying. He witnessed to them from morning till evening, explaining about the kingdom of God and from the law of Moses, the prophets. He tried to persuade them, argue them into it about Jesus. And then in verse 31, when the Jews didn't accept what he said, he said, okay, I'll take this same salvation to the Gentiles. And here's the final word from Luke. Paul proclaimed the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Messiah with all boldness and without hindrance. Isn't that marvelous? I believe that is beautiful simplicity. So Jesus was the source of Paul's identical gospel of the kingdom. There is a Matthew, the parable of the soul, which you need to preach, you who teach and preach. You need this every, every Sunday about 10 times. I'm kidding. But the parable of the sower is everything. That's how you get immortality. Jesus then said, this is why I speak to them in parables, which are comparisons, illustrations. Though seeing, they don't see. Though hearing, they don't hear, hear or understand. And that's what is happening then by way of fulfilling the prophecy of Isaiah, where it says, you will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You'll be ever seeing, but not perceiving. For this people, he puts the blame on the people, please note, not on God. This people's heart or mind, because the heart in the Bible is the mind, has become callous. They barely hear with their ears and they have closed their eyes. Don't give up because there are folk out there in your circle of friends who will open their eyes. Believe me. And they are so thrilled and excited when you show them. Otherwise, if they didn't close their eyes, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts and turn or repent and I would heal them. Then he says to his own little crowd of disciples, blessed, congratulations to your eyes because they see, your ears because they hear. Truly, I tell you, many prophets, righteous people long to see the kingdom of God being preached by Jesus, but not, did not see it. Then he goes on to explain the parable. When anybody hears the message about the kingdom, that's Matthew 13, 19. Not any old message. Not will you accept Jesus in your heart. Won't you ask Jesus into your heart, which is meaningless. Not clear enough. When anybody is exposed to the gospel message about the kingdom and doesn't get it, the evil one, that's the devil, comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. Let me give you that in the Lucan version. You've got three versions. His disciples asked him what this parable meant. He said, the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to others I speak in parables, comparisons, so that though seeing they may not see, hearing they may not understand. This is the meaning on page three of my paper now. This is the meaning of the parable. Then he says, the see Jesus is a brilliant teacher. He was at dazzling those PhDs when he was 12. He had a way of getting to the point like Churchill did. The seed is the gospel of the kingdom. You have to compare the three accounts to see the right definitions. It's the word of God. Same thing. When you pick up your Bible and say, I got the word of God here, you're misleading people. Yes, you've got the words of God, but the word of God is the in-house technical term for the gospel of the kingdom. The message, the saving message. So the seed is that gospel of the kingdom, Matthew 13, 90. There's along the path of the ones who hear. Now look, and then the devil comes and snatches away that word of the kingdom from their hearts so that they may not believe it and be saved. That is a terrific verse. Talk about a high tension verse. You've got the devil, the gospel of the kingdom, believing in your heart. This verse needs to be absolutely underlined, underscored in your Bible and preached wherever you can. And then he goes on to say they believe for a while. So it's not once saved, always saved. But in time of trial, they give up. I would not want to depress you this evening by telling you of a hundred people 
in our own knowledge, our own acquaintance, who were very much on fire, but really are now atheists or nothing. We have to make sure that our brothers and sisters stay on the game until the end. The seed that fell among the thorns stands for those who hear, but as they go on their way, they get choked by life's worries, riches, pleasures, and they don't mature. But the seed on the good soil stands for those who have a noble and good heart. So there is something in the human heart which can respond. I don't understand how God can say repent or God through Jesus can say repent and believe the gospel if it's impossible for you to do that. That just isn't good sense. You have to choose. In fact, let us return. You'll find the Old Testament that people of Israel say, let us return to God. Well, of course, we can't do that because that repentance would be a work. So that, that's just nonsense. No, there is an element of choice in everything we're doing. I think next year we should talk about Calvin against Arminian and uh, try to sort out some of that good stuff. It's most important to understand the mechanics of salvation. In Mark then, look at this. He told them the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you. Wow. But to those on the outside, everything is in parables. They're enigmas. They're not clear. So that they may be ever seeing but never perceiving ever hearing, but never understanding. Otherwise, that's to say, if they understood the gospel of the kingdom, not if they vaguely understood that by accepting Jesus, that's not good enough. So it's not sufficient to teach that God is one. That's brilliant and wonderful. But you must teach the whole of the Great Commission. That's a very important point. You cannot afford not to preach the gospel. So please reassure us, whoever you are, that you're going to proceed to preach the whole truth of God as Paul did. So otherwise then, if they did understand the kingdom, they would turn, repent that is, and be forgiven. You can't be forgiven. You cannot be forgiven according to these texts until you believe in the kingdom because gospel is about believing in the kingdom and repenting. This is actually very simple once you see it. And I believe the Abrahamic people saw this uniquely and outstandingly well in the 1850s. Now, Tom Wright, you've all heard of Tom Wright, the world's most famous current writer on Christianity and on Jesus. He says this, making my point, the church's use of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, has given very little attention to what the Gospels themselves are saying about the actual events of Jesus' life and his kingdom gospel of salvation. Therefore, the church is in effect sitting on, this is from Tom Wright, but paying no attention to a central part of its own investigation, its own tradition that might perhaps, that's a Britishism, leave that out, would certainly revitalize or reform the church significantly if it were to be investigated. This must involve, he says, understanding what the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are saying, don't ever say the gospel's in the Old Testament. Fall on your knees and beg God to be forgiven for that because it's absolutely false, alas. To contend oneself with a non-historical Christ of faith seems to me demonstrably false to the New Testament. You just talk about Jesus vaguely, apart from his kingdom message, this would be demonstrably false. So what is Christianity then? our basic question. Amos 8.12 reads like this. People will stagger from sea to sea and from the north around to the east. They will wander about looking for the word of the Lord, the gospel of the king, but they won't find it. This reminds us of Jesus' own question, when the son of man comes, will he find the faith on the earth? He didn't answer the question. I'm hopeful he will, but he wondered if it would be prevalent. The truth of what Amos wrote and Jesus ponds apparently and urgently relevant for our present time. So use this article to check yourself, please. Are you clear about what Christianity as taught by Jesus and the rest of the Bible really is? First question to all would-be believers is, what is the gospel as Jesus preached it? We've got a mass of stuff at our site focused on the kingdom. Browse in some of that sometime and you'll see how we make this point. What did Jesus teach about being saved, gaining immortality, living literally forever? Does that sound like an important issue? It's the only question that ultimately matters. What am I supposed to understand and believe in order to be a genuine believer? 
You might think that following the words, teachings, and gospel of Jesus Christ would be the obvious basis for true Christian faith. But now, I'm going to shock you again, I hope, but leading evangelical scholars say, no, it's not. That's Antichrist. Please read and ponder the following amazing quotations from leading evangelicals. Yes, please be suitably shocked and driven to do your part to remedy this tragic situation. We're all commanded by Jesus to be involved in the Great Commission. That's common ground for all of us. Teaching as true Christianity, the teachings of Jesus the Messiah, correct? Now listen to this. Dr. James Kennedy, now deceased in 2007. Listen to this. He's in the pulpit with his robes saying this. Many people today think that the essence of Christianity is the teaching of Jesus. That's not so. The teachings of Jesus are somewhat secondary to Christianity. If you read the epistles of Paul, which make up about half the New Testament, you see almost nothing whatsoever about the teaching of Jesus. That is so false, it makes you want to scream. Not one of his parables is mentioned, in fact. Throughout the rest of the New Testament, there's little reference to the teaching of Jesus. In the Apostles' Creed, the most universally held Christian creed, no reference to the teaching of Jesus or the example of Jesus. In fact, in recounting Christ's earthly life, the creed states simply he was born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius, Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead and buried, and rose on the third day. Yes, that's the problem. Billy Graham says, nothing against Billy Graham, but he says, the gospel is that Jesus came to do three days' work to die, to be buried and right. That is absolutely false. And it was one of your good ancestors in the Abrahamic faith who warned me strongly against ever trying to converge or coalesce or mix and mingle with that false form of the gospel. So this is a huge falsehood, I said, since Paul preached the same gospel of the kingdom as did Jesus. There are the verses. Our students memorized those, had to memorize them, Exactly. There they all are. So when you think of this amazing statement, I'm just piling on the agony here. Would you be taken in by the following? Dr. Harold O.J. Brown said, Christianity takes its name from its founder, or rather from what he was called, the Christ, Messiah. Buddhism is also named for its founder. And non-Muslims often call Islam Mohammedanism. But while Buddhism and Islam are based primarily on the teaching of the Buddha, Christianity is based primarily on the person of Christ. That's so clever and so deceptive. The Christian faith is not belief in his teaching, but in what is taught about him. The appeal of Protestant liberals to believe as Jesus believed, that's what I'm promoting, rather than to believe in Jesus, is a dramatic transformation. I say that's a colossal lie. I want your children and all your relatives to understand how glaringly dangerous is that false teaching. Now, what about C.S. Lewis? Lewis denies Jesus while claiming to follow him. He wrote, the Gospels are not the Gospel. What? Do you grasp what he says here? So then the words of Jesus, going to Lewis, are not the Gospel. This must be the ultimate falsehood. I want you to see that as a false prophet. Jesus said, beware of false prophets. So then Jesus has to be rescued from the church. Absolutely. Remember, the four Gospels make up about half of the whole New Testament. They're dedicated to what Jesus taught as the saving Gospel. Dr. James Dunn, a famous man with whom we've corresponded over the years, very useful for us because he is now a unitary monotheist. Dunn says this, Hurtado, gentleman who died recently, I interviewed him some years back, doesn't think it was necessary for Jesus to have thought and spoken of himself in the same terms as his followers thought and spoke of him. What? In order for the convictions of those followers to be treated as valid. In other words, it wouldn't matter if the followers of Jesus had the same words as Jesus. That wouldn't matter. Though he then takes it back with the other hand and says, he notes that most Christians probably think that's vague fog language. Probably think there's some degree of continuity. What? Jesus said, my words, my words, my words. Jesus is such a brilliant teacher. Listen to this. He said, believe in me, because what I give you are the teachings of my father. What is that phrase exactly? My teaching is not mine. A clever way to get your attention. It's the teaching of the father who sent me. That's in John 7, 16. All right. So 
Dr. Tabor, you see, I've been collecting these quotes over the years. I'm amazed and dismayed to find, and I am too, not even a passing mention of the theme, which was the core of Jesus' gospel, Kingdom of God. He wrote to Christianity Today. He was commenting on the fascinating article in Christianity Today, February the 7th, 2000. It was called, What's the Good News? Nobody mentioned the kingdom. How profoundly shocking and true was the observation of another fine scholar who visited us, stayed with us, where he said, interpreters of Christian persuasion have normally ordinarily not been especially interested in what Jesus intended and did in his own time. That's pure antichrist if they don't. That's why I titled my talk, Will You Please Accept Jesus? Then Wolfson, the church fathers, Carlos has dug this book out for us, most useful. Listen to this, the church father's conception of the Trinity was a combination of Jewish monotheism, that would be Jesus's creed, and pagan polytheism. Do you want pagan polytheism in your faith? I hope not. Except to them, to the church fathers, this combination, this converging, this mixing and mingling was a good combination. In fact, it was to them, the church fathers, an ideal combination of what is best in Jesus, Jewish monotheism, and what's best in paganism. Consequently, they gloried in it and pointed to it as evidence of their belief. We have on this testimony, Gregory of Nyssa, one of the great figures in church history. His words are repeated by John of Damascus and so on, it's detail. He says then, the quote coming up, for the truth passes in the mean between the two conception, destroying each heresy. Now note what heresy is for this church father accepting what is useful to it from each. The Jewish dogma, that's Jesus' creed, the Shema, is destroyed. Carlos has been showing us from history, they passed laws against the Shema, the very thing we're promoting. You weren't permitted as a Christian to recite the Shema. So then encouraging statement, a few lines lower, uh, no responsible New Testament scholar would claim the doctrine of the Trinity is taught by Jesus. I want you to understand it. Our unitary monotheism, our belief in the one God that makes us unpopular, is held by the top scholars at Oxford, Cambridge, Yale, and Harvard. Absolutely, if you read them carefully. Then I've got a quote from Henry Alford. He's a rather remarkable British commentator. He uses this language about doing away with words in, in, in regard to the millennium. I won't read all of that, but look at the dark section towards the end. If you say that the first resurrection is only a, quote, spiritual resurrection, not a literal one, but the second resurrection is a real one, if you do that, then there is an end of all significance in language. And scripture is wiped out as a definite testimony to anything. How very true. Marvelous statement. Okay, we're moving towards the end of our time. Uh, tell me when to stop, Sarah. It's time already. I want to mention only one thing. The rest I leave you uh, to read on your own, please. And do by all means write to me at Anthony Buzzard, mindspring.com. Anthony Buzzard at mindspring.com. Please don't hesitate to write me a note. If something you see isn't right, you have a question about it, because this is what we do from eight o'clock in the morning till 10 o'clock at night, dealing with every imaginable question. We don't have all the answers, but we can usually find them if we go after them. Finally then, here's a new book from somebody called Forrest Maredi, and it's called The Red Pill Gospel. You have to be a film expert to know what that means. Apparently there was a film in which a red pill was the answer to your living in La La Land. That was a blue pill, you were in bad shape. You took the red pill and you got sanity. And he's read my books on the kingdom and thanked me for them. I'm delighted with that. But the red pill gospel is brilliantly well written. And he says on page 51, the capital G gospel is not just a promise of the forgiveness of sins, but something much more significant. If you have only ever understood the gospel to mean accepting Jesus died for you, if you've only accepted that, you may have never fully understood the profound hope and joy the gospel entails. This is what it means to be a Christian, believing in Jesus as the Messiah, 
the Lord of the coming kingdom of God, with creation restored, the promise of eternal life, and the blissful reunions that will follow. Embrace that hope, have faith. Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest, shout it now, even the stones will cry out. Daniel 7, 27 says that all nations, tongues, and languages will have to obey the saints. The translations are hiding there. I know that God and Jesus are to be a bit, I get that. But I hope you've also read 1 Peter 1, 7. When you succeed at the resurrection and given immortality, this will be praise and glory and honor for you. That's amazing. Some of these things are hiding in translation, but God is very thrilled with his own creation. Maybe he's more excited about your talent than you are. So remember, we need Jesus. We need God, but he also and Jesus need us. Back to Robin Todd's famous phrase then. You are training to be part of the solution to the chaos which you now currently see. Okay, thank you. All right. <clears throat> people were saying keep going, but uh, <laughs> I guess your, your people there are wrapping you up. <laughs> Absolutely. Your, your handlers? <laughs> yes, no, I've got lots of guides and advisors. Yeah. <laughs> very careful to listen to, of course. Okay, doke. Um, let's see, some questions here, Anthony. Yeah. Uh, people are very interested because we unveiled yep. the second edition coming out in a couple of mon months. It's off to the printers. Mm. So there is a question here. Yep. Uh, can you briefly give us a quick background into the second ed edition? Uh, so what sort of changes can we expect? Yeah. Uh, and the yeah changes let's start with any any changes well changes are that we used a different basis you know many translations use somebody else's work as a basis you don't need to translate new and jesus saw the crowds and went across the sea and so on so unfortunately in our first edition we used a translation that was not public domain it was an innocent mistake so we had to redo it and this is a second edition. The notes are very much the same. It's not a perfect translation. No translation is. But it has all of the themes that you are used to. The sleep of the dead, the one God, Messiah, Jesus, the kingdom of God, gospel. I think you'll find the notes of interest. Best of all, the introduction, which is long, about 40 pages. The quotations are amazing. Christianity has been censored. And locally in your churches, your friends are not getting from the pastor, the fullness of the gospel. So hope you'll find it of interest. It'll be available at the college and at Amazon and so on. That there is the picture of the slice of Eden, as Joel Hempel called it, the stream in our own property. God gave us a slice of Eden to live on. My wife is a master gardener and the colors of the flowers are spectacular. And I'm walking through the property today and thinking, why did God bother to make these amazing dragonflies or the hummingbirds? Why did he bother with all that? I can only think following Robin Todd's excellent point about the creation so that we would admire the amazing design. The, the swallowtail butterfly is a miracle of artistic brilliance. We've got rock and streams of water. The house is on a hill. And you come up a long drive to see it, please do visit us, drop by and see us or stream with us on a Sunday occasionally. The, all the instructions are there easily at Focus on the Kingdom. Do write to us. Keep in touch during the year. It's such a blessing. We do thank all of the speakers profoundly for all the work you've done and for you, the audience, without which there would be no conference. Oh, also, Anthony, about the translation, yeah. you, you translated yourself some of the letters from the Greek. Mm. And they want to know what the manuscript base. Did oh, okay. you employ the Nestle Allen? I did, I did or... use the Nestle Allen because everybody uses it. And uh, that's entirely true. I don't even remember because it's been so many years, which books exactly. But particularly, John, I think I did it from scratch. But this is completely open domain. We've plagiarized nobody. It was an innocent 
I stress that mistake that we got the wrong translation to use as a base. Somebody picked up on that very kindly. So we did the whole thing over. And I think you'll enjoy it. And uh, none is perfect, though. The translation is wrong in certain little places, no doubt. But we have Lord with a little L. I just mentioned this. The Lord Messiah is not the same as the Lord God. When we said this to James White, the Trinitarian, he had not ever heard it before. There's one Lord God, the Father, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 8. And there's one Lord Messiah. Ah, then Jesus must be Lord in the same sense that the Father is. No, no. If you had read Psalm 110.1, and this is yet to break out there, You'll find the second Lord in Psalm 110.1. And ease, even the easy to read version that Sean mentioned, they don't get that right. They contradict themselves. That second Lord there is not God. Yahweh or Jehovah, as Nehemiah Gordon, a Karite Jew, has recently discovered many, many manuscripts which seem to have the word Jehovah. It doesn't matter. The Greek New Testament makes no issue out of that at all. We don't need to react and go all Hebrew rootsish. Paul is against that. So um, you'll find that the translation reads easily, I think. It's a good paraphrase, and it has a com completely unique Abrahamic flavor to it. Have you thought about translating the Old Testament? <laughs> no, I think I'm too old for that. It's been well done by many people. Uh, it would be fun to do, actually. It's all about the kingdom. It's all about the kingdom and the one God. But it's not just about the one God. You cannot have people in your group who are confused about the gospel. <laughs> they may understand the one God, but you then have the obligation to say publicly and clearly, so we can all see what you're doing, I suggest, that you're now going to teach them not to be preterists, to say that the second coming happened in 70 AD, not to be our mills uh, as the Church of Christ. You must teach them the proper understanding of the kingdom of God, gospel, and the things concerning Jesus. Acts 8. 12. Uh, Matt Sacra, mm. when, when so many today trade the kingdom for puffy clouded heaven, <laughs> yes. when sin is defined as a substance in physical bodies yes. and as inevitable when righteousness is not defined in new covenant context of obedience right. to God and Jesus, um, what do you say about that comment? Well, I, I understand that danger. The, the thing is that in the New Testament, we are to follow the teachings of Jesus. I don't think anybody does it to perfection now. That would be called sinless perfection. Jesus did say, forgive us our trespasses. And John says, if anybody sins, there's a forgiveness and so on. But we had better be living at a very high standard. I think that Matt is absolutely right. The notion that we're all just wretched sinners continuously actually denies the faith entirely what good did it do us so the point is exactly right we're to follow the standards of jesus in the law of moses first corinthians 9 20 paul said he's a jew i'm not under the law of moses but i'm willing to do some of those things to keep people happy to those under the law I'm willing to go under the law, but I myself, Paul, am not under the law of Moses. Let's be clear on that, if we're clear on anything. So there's one faith for everybody, one gospel. And if you find things in the translation you think are awkward or wrong, please let me know. And in the third edition, if that happens, we will change it, of course. Good question. Thank you. All right. We'll wrap it up. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you. Thanks a lot for your continued uh, work. And uh, let's see, we'll wrap it up. Uh, let's, uh, we're back in the morning. Well, officially, the conference has ended. Can you, can you believe it? It's gone so quick oh. <laughs> already. Okay. But hopefully, this, is, this was the first, the first ever virtual conference. Any last words, Anthony, for next year? Hope we yeah, can get together. Come, yeah. Thanks again to Carlos. It's a wedding anniversary for Carlos and Sarah this very day. So they've been having a pile of work to do, and it's all gone very smoothly. But where would we be without you as audience? Do keep in touch a little bit more, and don't wait till next year. Do talk to us from time to time. Tell us what you're doing, especially what you're doing with your activism in getting the gospel of the kingdom out there to the public. All right. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you. 
All right, folks, that wraps it up. That's it. No more. <laughs> uh, I just want to thank everyone out there. I mean, you are the reason we do what we do and what we do, we love. And thank God that you are out there supporting us. Again, I'd like to thank all our donors, uh, people who have donated towards the uh, conference. Uh, a lot of people, a lot of you um, paid for your conference cost, I must say, and you donated that those, those funds. So uh, we did have to refund some of you, but others uh, just donated it. So I have to mention that in, I'm not going to name names. I'm not going to say, but I have to mention that uh, the great heart that some of you showed for the ministry, uh, perhaps for Anthony himself, but we know that it's not about any person. It's not about any one individual. It's about the mission, the gospel about the kingdom of God and that uh, kingdom of God is coming. So what else can we say? Uh, we thank you. We love you. We wish you the best. Uh, we want you to keep safe during this time of uh, gloom and doom. But remember, um, when it's darkest, right, the saying goes, when, when it's night and it's the darkest, that's when you know that the dawn is approaching. And that's really what the whole Bible is about, folks. It's about that morning star that is about to rise and give life, new life to everything, not just us. But the whole of creation, uh, read Romans 1, creation itself is yearning, longing, it says, uh, for that day, that incredible day. So we love you. We thank you. I hope some of you uh, can come back tomorrow morning. And again, if you're on the focus on the kingdom.org site, you see there Saturday, 1030 a.m., 1030 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Remember, New York time. If you're overseas, we will be guided through a beautiful sermon, I'm sure, from our beloved Pastor Dennis Baldwin, Seed Sown Among Thorns. What a beautiful title. So 10.30 a.m., he will officiate the communion. We'll have an online communion. We usually do in the when we're present in the room, but uh, Pastor Baldwin will conduct that. Again, any papers? Uh, again, um, by the way, not all presenters um, give us papers. That's just up to them. We don't require papers from all presenters. Uh, so just click on presenters, go to folder, papers, click once. Hopefully it works. And uh, now I'd like to say before also we close, a special thank you to Pastor Alex Davila. He is our web designer, the webmaster, all these pages you see, the focus page, this page, the streaming, it's not possible without him. He is the brains really behind this whole online venture. And I like to thank him very much. He lives in Nicaragua in Central America. That's where I was born. So he's a compatriot of mine. And um, he's they're going through tough times there, as I told you before, with the COVID, the virus, add, add, add to that the, th the third world conditions there. So please pray for Alex, his family. Uh, we have had some losses there. Uh, a brother died due to the COVID, so uh, prayers for them. But Alex uh, is an incredible worker, as you can see. Look at this. He's put all this together. And um, there's Anthony's paper. You click once. And there it is again, alert and alarm. And then Sean Finnegan can trace his paper. My paper, I think um, I think uh, Pastor Baldwin has a paper as well. So just come back to this page, refresh it, that little um, arrow there. And uh, they should be online there. And that's it. That's another year. Uh, hopefully next year, uh, you know, I guess, can it get worse? I guess it can It can get worse, but it's, it's supposed to get better before it gets really bad, right? In the end days, as, as the uh, prophets say, as Jesus said. 
Okay, once again, folks, I'd like to leave you with this uh, uh, verse from Isaiah. Actually, it's a verse from Isaiah, but it's really the whole chapter. Listen to this. One day God will remove the cloud of gloom, the shadow of death that hangs over the earth. And we long for that day. So let's close with prayers. Join me with, with online prayers here for everyone. Thank you, Father, for this incredible time of fellowship. Look after the individuals, the families out there that cannot find physical fellowship. We hope, Father, that through this incredible technology that you have allowed us human beings to create, that they can be um, comforted in this time, comforted in their loneliness, in any tribulations that they may, may be going through. We know that one, get, one day, God, you will send your son. He will return. We believe that with every fiber of our being. We believe that he's coming to remove this shadow of death that hangs over the whole earth. It hangs over all of us. We're all going to die. That's just the hard truth. But one day you will remove that, that horrible shadow. Father, we uh, pray for those who are ill at this time. Uh, we know many brothers and sisters going through cancer and other issues, personal problems, either family problems, marriage, children, loneliness problems. Father, we ask you to be merciful on us all. We are all sinners. We all sin, but we have the blood of your incredible son, Jesus. So we ask you, Father, to forgive us now as we seek your face every day, as we try to do what your son told us to do, because we know that his words are your words, Father, because you were in him. So, Father, we thank you again. Jesus, we love you. We thank you for this time. Jesus, we know you're up there listening to us as well. And we pray for the church, your international church, the international Israel of God, that one day we will be collected in the air and uh, we will come back down and reign and rule with Christ and fix, fix this whole world. God bless you, everyone. Thank you. Until we meet again, God bless.